Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Raymore City Council work session for Monday, February the 4th. We'll go ahead and start off the meeting. Several items on the agenda tonight, first one being a hoarding report, and I will, on our hoarding ordinance that we adopted some time back, and so I'll turn it over to Mr. Fearborn. Thank you, Your Honor, and I will turn it immediately over to Mr. Catteret to make this presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so staff uh, wanted to provide council an update uh, on what we've been you know, utilizing uh, regarding the, the hoarding ordinance. If you recall, those was a little over a year ago, January of 2018, when council adopted the hoarding ordinance. That was really done in a response to staff's request to create an additional tool for us to use. We had the property maintenance code, which was working very well on our, our minor uh, property violations where complaints came in, isolated properties, and we were able to address them with the property owners, usually within a very reasonable amount of time. The concern we were having is we have, you know, we, we have instances where we have properties that affect a greater area, almost affect a neighborhood from the presence of the, of the violations, and almost is, is more of an issue than a simple property maintenance code violation. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, with the hoarding, it's a very extreme situation. It's probably existed for a period of time. Um, and something that gradually occurred over time, usually it starts out, you know, items just start being accumulated and it just continues to grow and it becomes more than just a simple property code violation. And there's often, uh, you know, underlying issues behind it. We needed a way to try to address some of the uh, behavioral matters, you know, issues that can occur with uh, hoarding situations. So uh, staff, Mr. Deal and myself worked with Chief Zimmerman, Captain Wilson to, to create the ordinance. If you recall, uh, this was a new section of our code, a new chapter of our code, where we established the definitions we needed for hoarding, for dangerous accumulation, for long-term storage of materials. We had to identify, you know, what classified as a unlawful accumulation. Uh, we stated, of course, hoarding was a public nuisance, and it also uh, provided us the authority to consult with our uh, mental health, behavioral health organizations to be able to get, provide some assistance in that way. Also regulated the hoarding of animals should that situation occur in our city. Um, so it was in April of 2018 when we first applied the ordinance to a property. We had a property that we felt uh, fit the definition that we created for hoarding. Uh, we, so we went, went through the process we typically do, which is send a notice to the property owner. This particular property owner had been notified you know, many times over many years. We would gain some compliance, but never, never gained full compliance. So this went on for a long time. So we felt the ordinance was appropriate to apply in this particular property. When we notified the owner initially, you know, no response, didn't necessarily expect a response. So we followed up in April with a, a citation, a notice to appear uh, in city court, which then prompted the property owner to uh, come into city hall. Just showed up one day, as often occurs. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Neal was here, was able to talk to that property owner at that point in time. So I want him to kind of go over that discussion because that's really where the uh, effect of the ordinance kicked in, when we really started to get the attention of that individual, but in a manner that, you know, trying to be helpful as well. And I think that was really the key and, and Mr. Deal's efforts on that, I think were key. So I want him to go through just briefly on that discussion. He'll go through the steps through the entire process and then we'll kind of close up with uh, some pretty incredible before and after photographs for you to view and then try to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you everyone for giving me the chance to come and show some success that we've had. Um, the turning point uh, with this resident really was that first initial meeting where he came in uh, to sit down with us and and have a uh, quite an emotional conversation. Uh, the first thing the individual said to me was, uh, "I know that I have a problem. I know I'm a hoarder, and I need help." And uh, and he became very emotional. Uh, immediately, I knew that this was the conversation that I'd been waiting on uh, for quite some time. So I informed uh, Chief Zimmerman and Captain Wilson so they could be a part of that conversation. Um, we all sat down, uh, and the individual actually agreed to make contact with our community mental health liaison right then and there, uh, made a phone call, uh, while we were all there, uh, but we still had the, uh, issue of the court date 
uh, approaching. So uh, just, uh, excuse me, let me get my thoughts together here. Uh, after uh, the first court appearance, we kind of came up with a new systematic plan to kind of address the issue as a whole. Uh, the plan was to go to the property, take pictures, work with uh, the property owner, um, have discussions with the property owner, and then present those pictures with a report um, to the prosecutor um, so that the judge would then be able to order sp very specific items to be removed from the property. Uh, at first, these items were, seemed very small and insignificant. Um, we were a little bit concerned at first. It was, could have been something as simple as a gas can. Um, but this was done purposefully to be able to spur a greater amount of success um, as we progress to larger uh, items on the property. Um, those successes and the small items spurred further success um, because throughout that we were encouraging that individual um, every time uh, there was a victory. Of course, we applauded that and, and pointed out that we were very appreciative of the efforts that the individual was making. Um, I continue to maintain communication with the resident as the follow-up dates approached. Um, like we said, this started in April of 2018. Um, we really didn't finish the process until December, and, and we had follow-ups um, nearly every two weeks. We had a few stints where it was a longer period between then. Um, but during that time, uh, in talking with the resident, I was allowed uh, on his property and uh, took pictures each time. Um, and keeping that positive relationship and positive communication with the resident was really helpful. Um, there were a few instances where progress uh, kind of stalled out, but we had some more uh, uh, serious conversations with the resident, um, advising them that the progress wasn't quite there yet, but we were on way, um, and we continued with that. Uh, toward the end of the process, we actually discovered that the resident had begun receiving help uh, from a family member, so through the treatment that he was actually pursuing, um, made contact with family, and family began to help. Uh, that individual worked heavily with me and was actually able to convey some of my points in a different way that that individual was able to receive. It, 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 things can come a little different from a family member than someone from the outside, uh, and that was very helpful. Um, we actually achieved full compliance on the property on December 12th of 2018, uh, at which point the judge placed the resident on a one-year uh, SIS during that time, uh, my plan is to just periodically check, uh, see if any of the conditions of the property are returning uh, to how they used to be. Um, it's also our understanding uh, in some conversations we've had with the family member um, as well as that resident that they are still seeking treatment uh, to resolve that issue. Um, without the cooperation of our department, the police department, the ordinance that you guys approved for us, uh, the community mental health, um, without all of those pieces coming together, I don't believe we would have been able to achieve the success that we did uh, on this particular property. So I took some pictures. Uh, I've gotten all this together from the very beginning to now. Uh, hopefully you enjoy. Uh, so this is the front of the property. Um, this would be the north west corner of the property. Um, these pictures will proceed, if I'm remembering correctly, um, counterclockwise around the property. So that's now the same location. This is the front of the house facing south, and the current state of that now. Same, similar area, just showing some of the more uh, accumulated items. One of the largest hurdles we had on this property was the sheer number of vehicles that were accumulated on the property, uh, which then gave more locations for items to be stored, uh, and the removal of those helped with that tremendously. Uh, the front entryway, um, this was a large area that uh, we gained success on early from a safety aspect. I think you have a couple more pictures of the front as well. This would be to the left side of the front door. And the right side of the front door. 
continuing on around the side of the house. Um, there were a lot of patio furniture sets on this property. Um, I couldn't tell you how many we saw removed. Going back to the backyard, the backyard is really where the accumulations had gotten out of hand. This is how it currently looks now. Um, this would be facing behind the house and how it currently is. It was a little bit dark that evening. <clears throat> this is facing the rear of the house. There is a rear access garage there with a driveway where that uh, larger vehicle is. Um, this is how that area currently looks now. All the vehicles on the property are now licensed and operable. Uh, again, more patio sets. Uh, this is the back corner of the property. Uh, behind me in this picture would be the garage area and how that area currently is now. This would be facing to the west. Uh, the garage area would be to the left. Uh, there we go. And just alongside the uh, northern side of the house. Again, the number of vehicles was a, a tremendous issue, and the fact that those vehicles were being used for storage of items, uh, that has also been resolved. So that's all the pictures I have for you. If I have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yep. Anybody have any questions? Great outcome. Thank you for, I know it took a lot of effort on our part as well to coordinate all this with the police department and you guys. and staying on top of it and following the ordinance as was proposed we appreciate it we truly i know we thank the many of the departments the court the court uh, clerk and judge niagara just did an outstanding job at handling this case really was impressive to why he's clearly done it before in other in other communities uh this very incremental process so it's a great learning experience for us as well so we're very appreciative of that help as well thank you mr townsend Sorry, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very um, pleased with the manner in which this was taken care of. Um, and, and one thing that came to mind, I was hearing the, the conversations you all had with the uh, resident and the discussions and the process that went through with the court was compassionate compliance with respect to how the, when the council's discussion with regard to the ordinance was being discussed and there was concerns about now, this may be a, a, a mental issue with some, and, and, and hearing the conversations with the gentleman coming in, and, and I don't know if it's the gentleman, I'm sorry, but the resident coming in uh, and having um, the, the conversations with staff and others and through the court process, um, was, there was some <coughs> compassion there, but also some compliance with the, with the time frame it took to get this resolved. And so I would only hope that the next, we don't have another incident, but when we do, um, law of averages and statistics, we may not have someone that they, they may need more compliance than compassion just because of how it is. But in this incident, I think it met with the intent of the ordinance uh, and it, with respect to how staff handled it as well and the court. So I appreciate that from that perspective as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Burke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know my sons noticed the work that was going on uh, by the city as we would come home from school and uh, see this location and it was it was really kind of exciting even though i really personally didn't have any conversations with with staff about it i could see that it was working i could see that things were happening and i i, I like the fact that that we were able to do it in a way that um, let people know that you know we're here to to help them with issues because um, sometimes people don't have people to help them so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barber. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can remember the discussions we had on this ordinance and you know we didn't take it lightly and it just um, I really appreciate you bringing this forward and the work you did on this because this is exactly what I personally had envisioned 
uh, with how it would be utilized. And I know there were some comments about, you know, the city's going to have a heavy, heavy hand in this. And I knew the intent was not there. And I knew it, it just, it affirms the trust I have in the staff um, in the chief uh, when they come to us with a problem that they need a solution for it. Just, um, this just confirms that uh, um, it, it was the right thing to do at the time and you guys did a good job with it. And this is a real personal thing too. And it, that must have been very difficult um, to have a discussion so personal with somebody like that. So I appreciate your hard work and sticking with it. And um, that, that was a lot of work cleaning that up. I mean, a lot of physical work to clean that up. That, uh, that, that's a very extreme case, but it, uh, I really appreciate your work and staying with it. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to the next item, a relocated Kentucky Road Project. I'll turn it over to Mr. Fearborn. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Have the, uh, when this first came forward, uh, as the council knows, we've had uh, some challenges relative to the land acquisition that is associated with the project that is relocated Kentucky Road. Uh, we've discussed that. Uh, before an executive session, when I was going to be bringing this item forward last week, there was uh, there was a, a a single course of action that I was going to be proposing tonight to the council. What I learned as we began the investigation on this last week to bring that forward was. I had been asking finance the wrong question about this project. I had been, there was originally X amount of dollars set aside for the project, and I had been asking them after paying the architect engineering firm for this, how much is left in that project fund. Because this is the last of the bond road projects, I should have been asking how much is in the bond road fund in total because 58 highway didn't cost nearly as much as we thought it was going to. We saved money on the Fox Ridge and the Johnson projects. We had bond premium in the road and we had interest that had been earned on all of those funds sitting in the bank during that particular period of time. So as it turns out, there is a considerable amount more remaining in the road fund from the bond issue that we can be using. That led to the possibility of three different options being presented to the council on relocated Kentucky Road. Because those items, all three of them, involve land acquisition, two of them could involve litigation, and I will be having a discussion with the council regarding eminent domain, I would ask that the council uh, allow us to take you into executive session at the end of this meeting to discuss this particular agenda item. And we'll have a roll call vote for that in just a little bit. And I've alerted Council Member Barber as to the, the motion that needs to be made. Okay. Okay. So our questions will be answered in executive session on this item. So we'll move on to the next item, which is Oates bus clarification. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Fearborn again. Thank you. In conversation last week with Council Member Abdel Gawad, uh, she had asked me about um, the contract that we have with OATS regarding the transportation that we're doing and the fact that OATS's, OATS interpretation of the contract, it's not specifically spelled out, but their interpretation of the contract, because Sarah was here that, that evening, and it was also Jonathan's interpretation of the contract, was that the contract was to serve Raymore residents only. When, we, when I look back and I watch the conversation, or, or it was their interpretation. Her question to me was, I thought that, I, I being council member of Delgawad, thought that that particular contract and our, our proposal was that it would serve Raymore and Belton residents. So I went back and I looked at the meeting and 
it, there had been a significant amount of conversation relative to this, and at the end of it, I tried to sum it up. And I used, there, Sarah still had three questions. One was, will shopping be allowed in Raymore and Belton? Two, will it be on demand? In other words, somebody picks up the phone and says, come to my house, or will it be group? And last was whether or not it was Raymore only or Raymore and Belton. In addressing those, I said, it's my understanding from the conversation the council had that it will be, and it may have been bad wording on my part. Um, it, it's my understanding that it will be group transportation, not on demand, that it will be shopping in Belton and Raymore, and that it will be Raymore preference. Preference was a bad word. That's a vague word, and I should not have used that word. I should have either stated Raymore only or Raymore and Belton only. To that end, I told Council Member of Delgawad that I would come back to you all tonight and ask what your interpretation of what I said was, or specifically, how do you want this service to be provided? The uh, and that's the simple question I have for you all this evening, basically. Not looking for a vote, just what your interpretation was. And and because it's not specifically spelled out in the contract, we would not have to come back to you all. It's just whatever you all's understanding of what this should be is. So I just wanted to ask the question. Mr. Townsend. I probably asked this question during the con during the council session before, but um, I'll ask again, just for conversation. <clears throat> Should, you know, this conversation leads to its well, both Belton and Raymore? Should, not saying, you know, but if the conversation goes that far um, and it ends up from a usage that it's more Belton than Raymore, how does that stand with respect to use of funds? That would be problematic, I suppose. And back to my conversation, you know, can we, with respect to that, allow it for Belton residents? Um, and should it be more, the service has to originate from Raymore? Jonathan, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm happy to try and provide an answer to that, Councilman. Um, the answer is uh, I understand that in Belton they do allow for it to occur for Raymore residents to be able to be picked up. However, the Oates bus in Belton is taking them back over for shopping in Belton specific. Um, <clears throat> that's in essence under helping the underlying uh, sales tax dollars for the city of Belton. On our side of it, um, you'd potentially be spending tax dollars of the citizens of Raymore for services being provided to citizens of Belton. That poses some concern from legal's perspective um, if it's going to be exclusively used. Now, I understand that preference would be provided, but if we find out that very few, if any, uh, Raymore residents are utilizing it um, for that purpose, it seems hard to believe that that would be an appropriate utilization of Raymore funds. Anyway, Mr. Berenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I, I would have to agree with uh, Mr. Zarin. Thank you for clarifying that. My concern here is that are we going to create, by not allowing Belton residents to use the service that we're funding, are we then going to create an issue uh, if Belton retracts and doesn't let the Raymore residents use the bus on, on their day? So I guess the question I want to ask is, is it worth trying? Is it worth doing a, uh, letting the Belton residents use the bus and giving the Raymore residents preference? and kind of keeping a very close eye on this contract for the next 90, 120 days to ensure that, that the majority of the funds are, are being used for res, Raymore residents. Uh, thank you. You want to answer that now, or we've got a couple of more inputs here. Okay, Mr. Holman. Thank you, sir. Um, I am in favor of the interpretation as outlined by Mr. Fearborn with group uh, transportation, uh, shopping on both sides, and um, Raymore residents only. And I, I don't think, in response to your statement, I don't think that it will create an issue with Belton. You want to remember, they're putting a little caveat on the back end of this, so they're protecting themselves from an economic standpoint. And should they decide to do that, should it become that petty an issue, we can readdress this at that time. But I think if, if we are using Raymore 
tax dollars to do this. And, and at least one of these routes, if not two, are being paid for by a private businessman, I believe. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. It's just the one day of the week. There is the opportunity for the other, you know, two days or three days for them to take uh, that route. I don't think that anyone's going to suffer by a route that didn't exist before. That's my opinion. Mr. Barber. Yeah, and I would concur with that. I, I believe the, the night we had the discussion, my comment was, you know, this is Reamworth's tax dollars. It needs to be utilized for our citizens. So that's, that's my opinion. I respect everybody's comments, but that's how I feel. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Circo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I uh, follow suit here with Mr. Barber. I think we're utilizing the funds. We're creating the Oats bus once a, a week. Uh, for the Raymore people or the funding for what we need here in our city. I don't think, like he's, like Mr. Holman said, I don't think Belton's gonna change a lot of their perspective of what they wanna do on who they pick up and what they do. But at this point in time, newly into this, I think we need to think about just keeping it with the Raymore, the Raymore tax dollars, pick up the people. And I agree with that too, I'm, I'm all for that too. What else, Mr. Kelly, you have anything on that? I didn't raise my hand, but I do have something. Uh, the one thing that I heard Mr. Holman say that I absolutely appreciate and totally support is that if this does become a, an issue that we can always readdress it. That, that is the most profound thing that, that I've heard, you know, going into the future. So, you know, I, the willingness of, of the body to readdress it as it goes out of its infancy and into a little more maturity is, is very, very encouraging for me. So I would support what staff's uh, uh, position initial is. Position, sure. Yeah. And that would be the initial position, correct? That everybody seems to be in. Uh, and, and I would point out Councilmember Member Delgawad was, was on the opposite. She was actually saying that she felt like her interpretation of it was that it was, that in fairness to her, that it was that what I had said should be interpreted as both sides and right. that that would be what she would be in favor of. What we could probably do is reverse this out. Um, we, if, if we go with Raymore residents only, go to Council Member Berenson's point, monitor it for 90 days, and if we're only getting one or two, even though we're advertising it heavily, we go back and we, we revisit whether or not to let that go. Now I realize that then you then you run into the question of okay, so are we going to fund it so that a majority of the people on it consistently are Belton folks who are riding it? Then we have another problem that we would have to look at. Mr. Barber, I have something to add to that. Um, I guess if we did that monitor and we discovered that we would have some belt. Belton people, maybe we um, make it just like they did for our citizens. They could only, the Belton people could only shop in, or come over in Raymore. It wouldn't be for taking them around anywhere in Belton. Yes, Mr. Berenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to add, and, and I'm not saying that I'm supportive of this 100%, but I do believe when we had the meeting, and, and my recollection is that we, I believe that we did decide to allow both and give preference to the Raymar residents. So uh, I understand we're, we're changing our position a little bit now, but I do want our money to stay within our city, but I, I still feel strongly that if, if, if we're talking about one or two people from Belton, if we, if we have extra room on the bus and it's not a big deal, I, I don't think it's really hurting that much to, to allow the Belton citizens to ride on the bus. Um, once we filled up all the seats with the willing Raymore residents, and I think that was what we had decided before. That was my interpretation, at least. Uh, so that's what I would support, uh, but I would also uh, support whatever you guys decide. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't think we're having a big influx of complaints from Belton residents not being able to have access to the bus on the days that the Raymore residents use it. Uh, it's my understanding that there's a couple of them that are buddies and like to ride together, and that's where the complaint has come up, is that the Belton resident was told, is for Raymore, sorry, and they can't ride with their pal anymore. So it kind of came back around through that circle. Um, so it, uh, you know, if we just have the one incident, it is a taxpayer's 
or our taxpayers are paying for it. Um, I do like your idea, though. If it's not putting any of our Raymore residents out of the bus for any purpose, and it doesn't put the, the bus in a position to be late getting somewhere or an inability to get somewhere, we might want to look at it as a preference only. So, Jim, I guess I would look for a little bit of clarification. So right now, the rules, as Sarah understands it, no Belton residents. Is that correct? And that's that is, the only, that that's is the only thing we're really talking about right now. That's correct, sir. We're staying with a group. We're shopping Raymore and Belton, but it was for Raymore residents only. That was her interpretation. Correct. And you're just wanting to know whether or not to stay the course. And that was it. That's exactly right, sir. Okay. And and that was it was Raymore residents only for both the the shopping trip, the secondary shopping trip if there is a fifth Monday, and definitely on the medical for the the route on the medical. Okay. Yeah, John. I'd like to add just two more points for anybody that, that's watching this meeting from home. Whether or not we allow the Belton folks to ride the bus, we're paying the same amount of money no matter what. So by the folks from Belton riding the bus, we're not paying any more money for them. Um, and the second point is, too, is even if, if some of them do ride the bus, they'll also have the opportunity to shop in Raymore, as I understand. So not only would we not pay any more, but we would have the opportunity for some of those Belton folks to spend some of their tax dollars in our fine city as well, too. Good point. Thank you. No, that's a good point. So now that we muddied the water a little bit uh, with that, I guess, so you're asking, do we change it up a little bit on the preferential thing, or do we go with the original um, rules as interpreted by Sarah? It, it, correct, sir. Okay. So I, I guess I'm kind of looking for you guys' uh, position on that. Do we stay the course, or do we allow for the the uh, the preference, so to speak, Joe. If if I can, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if I can recall, it was it was almost reaching the point of a contentious debate the last time we discussed this when she was here, and I believe we ended up taking a a six to I think it was a six to two vote that it would mostly be Raymore. If I, if I can recall, I haven't looked at the actual footage, but I believe that's the way it is sitting as well today. Kind of rolled out, yeah. Yeah, Jay. I would concur with Council Member Burke. I think his recollection is correct. I, again, I stand with the original interpretation as presented by Mr. Fearborn. Um, not that there's anything wrong with letting Belton residents ride. I, I'm okay with that. Um, the fact is, is this is simply a fiscal question. If we get to a point where we are paying for another city, it's, it's still a good item. These people still need transportation, perhaps. But we were asked to pay for a big chunk of school road that wasn't in our city either, and we chose not to do that because we can't fund everybody else's problems. This is a service that we came up with this year for our citizens primarily. If our citizens don't take advantage of that or the need is not there, after a while, I would be saying, why are we, why are we providing this? If we've only got one or two people each week for a year writing, that doesn't make any sense for us to continue to fund that program. They're apparently finding their own transportation needs, and Belton has their own way of addressing this with their funding and then the private funding that goes on. Sure. Well, we've been into this, what now, three months, four months? Yeah, just just last month. Just last month started. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Circo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I concur uh, with Mr. Holman. I think it's a trial and error basis. It's so new right now. We don't really know how many Raymore residents are going to be riding the bus. I think we need to just do what we're doing, pick up the Raymore people, see how many seats we have. If it's open ended, you know, we can look at maybe picking up more Belt and people and bring them over here, which is fine. But it's such a trial and error, I think we need to give some time to see how it's going to work out. Is it going to do really well for the Raymore people, or is it going to be a half a bus every every day that we use it, only a half a bus, and we can actually go to Belton and bring more people here to uh, spend money in Raymore? So I th but I think it's a trial and error. It's so new right now. We need to give it a trial yeah, and error time. I, yeah. I agree, Tom. I, you know, we haven't really, like Mr. Burns and said, we give it about a 90-day look-see and yeah. see how, how it kind of analyzes that. See yeah, how well it's doing. Sure. I haven't really had enough time to do it yet. Okay. 
Mr. Barr, do you have any motion? And say so we would bring it back in roughly 90 days and evaluate it and look at it and see, see what kind at. of facts and figures Sarah, Sarah yeah, can provide. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. How many riders we've had specifically from Belton and then, or specifically from Raymore, right. and then we can uh, revisit how you all want to proceed at that point in time. Okay. Perfect. Right. Sounds, Sounds good. All right. Thank you. But there's nothing else. We'll move on to the next item. Next item is Amazon delivery vehicles, and Council Member Berenson had requested that this item be added to the work session agenda, so I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Mr. Berenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I noticed a couple of years ago, I was seeing strange cars in my driveway and in the neighborhood, and it, it caught me off guard. We live on a dead-end street. We, if a car dash drives down our street, we usually know who they are. It's rare we see strange vehicles. And then I began to have neighbors ask about the Amazon delivery drivers. And since then, I've had other constituents within my ward and inside the city have asked, and, and, and I've seen a lot of conversation about, you know, the, the Amazon delivery drivers can be driving any sort of vehicle. Um, I had mentioned to the police chief uh, maybe a year ago, and, and, and she kind of thought we should keep an eye on it. Uh, are we creating an opportunity for somebody, can I take my car, um, I couldn't do this five years ago, but I can take my car right now and, and drive to Mr. Holman's house in the middle of the day and walk up to the front porch with a package and look inside your window and maybe walk around the back door. Is anybody going to call the police on me if I do that? Um, are we creating an opportunity for people to, to do nefarious things by, by allowing these people to make deliveries in an unmarked vehicle? So it, it's my proposal that we, at the minimum, have a discussion about requiring people that are making deliveries in our town to somehow mark their vehicle. I mean, something as simple as maybe how the, the pizza delivery guys do it. I would just like to see that, that when a vehicle is in my driveway that I know it's a delivery driver, um, somehow put a magnet on the vehicle or mark it. So my request is we just have a conversation about it. Anybody? Mr. Townsend. Aside from Mr. Barber having detention after this. <laughs> Went to merit. <laughs> um, question, not only Amazon delivery vehicles, but just in this age of mobile, you know, social, mobile media and, and Lyft and Uber and Uber Eats and all the different other apps that allow individuals to sign up to do not only ride share, but a delivery type service, how do we as a municipality police that? Um, being a suburb of Kansas City um, that you know, has a greater incentive uh, to allow that within their city limits. Um, that's my general question with regard to this one because as I was reading through this, you know, the agenda and saw the topic for tonight, I'm just trying to visualize um, how that would be, because right now anyone can grab, you know, if they're working at Pizza Hut, all they have to do is toss a little lighted sign on the top of their car, or I'm seeing Panera Bread now with a little lighted sign on the top of the car, or, or pick a business. Um, so it, it gets to how do we, one, inf write the code to enforce to get those national companies to, you know, register with us, um, and then, um, so, that's my discussion point. <laughs> Mr. Kello. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, being single and working the job that I do here lately, I do a lot of order in and order out. And pizza seems to be a, a staple at my house here lately. Uh, some more expensive than the others, some really cheap. Um, depends on how much overtime I get, I guess. But I, I will say this, out of you know the, the different f facilities I use here in Raymore, uh, there's only one that shows up at my house with a sign on it, you know, and, and I don't want to call them out because, and no, I'm not. But not, not, not all of our, our local businesses that, that make deliveries has a sign on, on their car, you know. I, there's been many times that a different car each time that I've ordered. So, you know, I don't know how we can, I, I don't know, create a, a, a bureaucracy or, or regulation without just 
having a huge kind of mess. Uh, opening up big Pandora's box here, I think. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess on, on the surface of it, with, with just a limited uh, discussion, I wouldn't be in favor of it. It's it just going to require a lot more um, due diligence to uh, come up with a uh, standardization plan or, or regulation. Yeah. Mr. Burke. Thank you. Um, when I was in college, one of my three jobs was delivering pizzas for Pizza Hut. And um, I remained in contact with most of the people that I worked with just for social reasons. But at the time, none of us had any lighted signage. Uh, there was no identification. But we were required to wear a uniform when we went to the door. And it was pretty obvious that we were working for Pizza Hut. Um, the new signs on the cars, I know I would have hated to have on my car as a, as a teenager. Um, but I do very uh, strongly. I, I am concerned about the number of people that are, that are perusing our streets, especially like the night before Trash Day. You see a lot of people traveling around looking for for things, and and I do think it's good to know who is in my neighborhood and if if they should belong there. But I don't know how we would do that. I don't know how we honestly. There, are, I'm sure there are businesses in our town that we're unaware of uh, that are operating out of homes, and I don't know how we how we do that better. Anyone else? Mr. Holman. I, uh, I'm certainly sympathetic to and understand Mr. Berenson's concern. Um, an unmarked vehicle, someone carrying it. It's usually more carrying the package away from the house than <laughs> carrying it to the, the now famous porch pirates, if you will, especially that we see around the holiday times. I, I would share the same concerns. I think that this is a, would be a difficult ordinance to enforce if we did it. However, I'm curious, Mr. Fearborn, would it be um, unthinkable for us to make contact as a city entity with Amazon just to ask them, uh, say, have you had concerns like this from other entities, other cities? Would, you know, do you have plans to mark your vehicles in the future? Would you be opposed to putting a magnetic sign on the side of your vehicles when you come into Raymore? And if they tell us to, uh, jump off a short pier, then so be it. A, a lot of it, uh, we, we can ask Amazon about that. Uh, if we're going to ask one, we need to ask them all. We'd have to ask Uber, we'd have to ask, yeah, a lot of these folks don't just deliver for Amazon. They'll have, they'll be delivering for two or three different companies. So maybe put a magnetic sticker on that identifies them as a delivery vehicle, but not necessarily an Amazon delivery vehicle. Uh, but then you're dealing with individuals and putting signage on their cars because a lot of them are using their private vehicle or they're renting a vehicle to do it. Uh, but yet yeah, we can certainly make contact with the heavy hitters and ask them if they would be willing to do it. They do have some marked vehicles, don't they? I mean, I, I've not, I've seen them. As a matter of fact, the, the day after I brought this up and I was setting the agenda and I, and I always run everything on the agenda so that she keeps track of my mind past uh, Miss Bratton, she actually looked out her window and took a picture of an Amazon delivery vehicle that was marked up. But they're very, they're very few. It's the first one I'd ever seen. It was painted on the side. But if the council wishes us to, we can make contact with, with the, the top five or 10 that we know are in the city doing that sort of a thing, if so directed. It, it would be a little bit difficult to enforce. Yeah, it would be. Mr. Barber. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's something that's going to, I mean, it's part of our society now. It's going to be more and more. We're going to see Amazon's just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see um, there's going to be more and more stuff brought to our homes. I think it may be a little akin to having the people knock on our door, have to register and wear a, you know, a badge. You know, in the old days, we didn't have to do that. You know, and then it got to be a problem, and so the city did that. So. Uh, I think at this point, it, um, this elephant may be too big to bite right now, but if we could at least maybe start the process. I remember 
when uh, John uh, Councilman Barrington called me and said, hey, are you seeing this? He was concerned. I think um, really the story was your daughters were in the front yard and you noticed like a van you didn't recognize come in and just kind of what the heck's going on here. So I think it's something whether we can do anything today, it's something I think uh, we need to maybe start the process and and see what we could do maybe because it's not going to, it's not going away. And we're going to have more and more people in our city. The other item I can do is uh, we could take a two-pronged approach. Uh, I'll, I'll get with um, the management team and we'll kind of uh, do a brainstorming of who would be the top 10, say, give them a call and find out, ask the question instead, would, instead of would you be willing, are, you, are any other entities, as Council Member Holman said, do, you know, requiring anything or is there anything out there that you all are aware of because of these concerns? And then the, the other prong that we could, that we could take would be to uh, uh, contact the MCMA listserv to find out if other cities from a city manager standpoint are actually trying to do anything with this. I have not heard of any, and I have not seen any questions asked on the on the listserv, but we'd be the first, so. Well, that's why I was wondering if MML was maybe mm -hmm. had their research team looking into it with, haven't been able to propose anything yet. Sure. Because it is kind of a, a fairly recent phenomenon. Phenomena. Sure. Mr. Townsend. Mr. Mayor and Mr. Furborn, you both hit it on the head. I was going to ask if you had done any, in addition to you know staff brainstorming as well as the, the city's managers, um, with the Missouri Municipal League and possibly even looking at the uh, National League of Cities to see if there's opportunities out there from research and, and other things to see if anyone's even approached this. Sure. Mr. Chief. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Why don't you come up here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Chief, you got some input there? Just one thing, uh, and I would encourage all of the council members, if you ever have a citizen contact you and, and they're um, concerned or um, you know, seeing suspicious people, suspicious vehicles, they don't know if it's a delivery vehicle, always call 911. Um, because you know we'd much rather come, and you've heard me say it before. We'd much rather come and find out it's an Amazon driver, an Uber Eats, or you know one of those folks that belong in the neighborhood, but they're in an unmarked vehicle, than to find out it's somebody casing the neighborhood. You saw in the weekly report that you know we caught some bad guys that had been breaking into cars. So uh, we would much, much rather come and and find out that that vehicle had a legitimate reason to be in your neighborhood. So. Um, please call 911 if you see any vehicle that looks suspicious or you just don't recognize it in the neighborhood as being one of your neighbors. If you could just give that to me in a little recording box, I can just push that button every time something like this comes up. Remind say, these guys. I say it all the time. I know. Well, I used to say it all the time myself. <laughs> yes, Mr. Holman. I just would like to ask Councilmember Berenson, so you initiated the topic and you've heard the discussion. Are you good then with just basically at this point, just some staff research on this, just to find out if maybe other entities like us have had concerns and if these larger heavy hitters have had um, any uh, corporate discussions about maybe moving forward on something like that? Yeah, thank you, Councilman Holman. I would support that and I would ask uh, additionally for those here tonight, just to kind of keep your feelers open for your constituents and your wards and see if, if, if you're kind of hearing and seeing some of the things that I'm hearing from, from some of my neighbors as well. But yes, I would support that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two things, of course. Uh, thank you, Chief Zimmerman. She's correct. I've had signs where I've seen cars sitting in my neighborhood for two or three, four days. It's sitting there. I don't know them. I haven't seen them. And I'll call and they'll send a patrol officer, come down, check it out. They do a really quick job and they'll make sure they mark it and they get it out of there if, they, if it's not supposed to be there or check with the neighbors. But that's a good thing. I do that quite often and I, it works very well. Thank you very much for that. We, we got a good police department who takes care of that immensely and on time. Uh, secondary, working for Uber for a year, I can tell you right now, Uber does put out constantly a lot of advertisement, a lot of emails about having your signs if you want them and they really promote it. I carry signs, magnetic, only because it's convenient for my people when I drive up, they see it's me. They already have a identification of the car and the driver, they know, but the Uber sign, they can see it better. I do it as convenience, but I don't think I can see 100 Uber people that I know 
and I, me and maybe one other might have Uber signs on there. The rest just don't do it. Uh, they do try to push it, though. Hopefully they would start doing that more because of the way society it is. I understand they do push it. But when you get to uh, Brown and you get to FedEx and you get to DLS and you get to these people, I think when they had their heavy push during the holidays, they were renting vehicles because they were running short and they didn't have time to do much but rent the vehicles. And I would see them and they'd get out Uber, I mean uh, Brown or somebody. But I think that was during the holidays really heavy. I don't see it as much during a regular season. I see most of the, their trucks are marked when they come through and the DLS, the yellow ones, they're all pretty well marked. But I do want to take it's a serious note that Mr. Berenson brings up because of children. You know, and what goes on today, society is pretty bad. And you got to be very careful. And I, I would like to really create more maybe neighborhood watches. I'd really like to get out and talk to the neighbors and say, let's create neighborhood watches. Let's get involved. Let's call, get the number. And I think that would be a good thing to promote in the future. As councilmen or members, we can go out and maybe push our agenda on neighborhood watches. Just get more people at, you know, involved like they should be. Anyone else? So we're going to look into it, check with some of the entities that do draw up legislation and regulation, we see where we go from there. Yes. Okay. And it, it, it's a line that we were actually joking around with this week, but to what the chief has said, um, it, we, we will guarantee 100% of 911 calls we will respond to. We will not respond to 100% of social media posts because we don't pick them up right away. So you might want to remind the public of that one as well. But I will say very proudly, and Mr. Fearborn wanted to make sure that that was in the weekly report so that you all saw it before you came tonight that it was a call from a neighbor on suspicious activity in their neighborhood. They saw these individuals wearing dark clothing running down the street, and we caught people who had been breaking into cars. And so, you know, that's because of the due diligence and the observation of neighbors calling us and allowing us to get out there and get those folks in jail. Amen to that. Yes, Mr. Holman. And just as an aside to that, Chief, we, we are fortunate we enjoy something that a lot of our metro area neighbors don't. What's our average response time on a call? Um, m most times less than two minutes. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the metropolitan agencies cannot say that or anywhere near close. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, well, we'll move on to our last item on the agenda, which is the work session participation by phone or Skype and Council Member Barber had asked this to be added to the agenda. So I will turn it over to Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I appreciate um, getting this on here. This is something that we talked about, uh, I think it's, man, it's been four years ago. And before this morphins into something that it's not, I want to be perfectly clear, I am not talking about a council meeting or an executive session. This would be a pure work session like this. But with um, Mr. Eke coming on board as an assistant city manager and his expertise in communication, and times are changing. Um, I thought this might be something that I'd like to get everybody's opinion on if they thought it would be necessary with, you know, people not getting out of the office in time or somebody having a sick kid and don't want to inoculate us with, with whatever their kids got. Um, just different things that come up. Is there, would there um, be a possibility to have somebody have a live um, uh, meeting, be able to be on the phone, be you know, to uh, ask questions and be part of the meeting, if that's something anybody else is interested in. It, you know, with myself personally, um, and my job and things that, uh, it, it doesn't really affect me, but I always look at things, I'm not gonna be in this position forever. Uh, we have different people come in, different lifestyles, and would it, would it allow somebody to participate when they couldn't? And would it be beneficial? So just kind of, and I don't know what's available either. That was part of this discussion too, is what could we do? What do we have? I don't, we don't have any money. We don't want to budget for this. And I don't want to have to spend any money for something like this, but do we have the tools right now that we can even do something like that? So that's, that's all I had to say. Respond first. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, it is really, I mean, we've all participated in meaningful conference calls. We have uh, over in the Gilmore room, in the storage closet over there, we have a, um, a, a phone extension that we call an octopus. 
and it, it, it is made to pick up sound and allow a voice to project in a room as large as this uh, very clearly. Uh, no one would have to be shouting into the phone. Uh, I'm, as I started with, I, I think we've all participated in conference calls that were meaningful discussions. That's what the work sessions are. There are no votes taken. It's mostly consensus, and if somebody's on there, as long as we remember they're there, uh, it, on a night like tonight, uh, I've been uh, guilty <laughs> uh, of that on a couple of different occasions because they just sat so quiet. The, uh, they would be able, on a night like this evening, they'd be able to participate out here, not go into executive session as the council member brought up. Staff had actually uh, recommended this once before, but we could bring that over any time somebody had announced that and just conference them in before the meeting started, as long as there were no votes. The, uh, the other item is materials that are presented that would create a little bit of a challenge were materials that would be presented that night, like Mr. Cataret's presentation tonight, where there was actually a visual. Uh, thinking through that, what we could do is, just before the meeting began, by then we've assimilated all those materials and all those materials, I would say, 100% of the time or in some sort of a digital format, we could simply email them to them as attachments so they could open them up wherever they're at and they'd, they'd have any presentations that were gonna be made that evening in front of them and they'd be on the conference call. Mr. Burke. I'm, I'm very glad you put this on our agenda to talk about. Um, we did talk about, I think it was in 2015 and uh, at the time people were not really heading in that direction but personally um, I have already scheduled a vacation this summer and I did one last summer where I went home after our meeting on a Monday night got in my car and we drove for the entire evening um, if I knew that we could participate in a Skype situation then I would always try to plan it for we have an executive or we have a, a legislative session where we vote and then that meeting that I miss would be a work session, but I, f I would feel like I would not miss it because I would have the opportunity to, to call in. I would very much like to be able to participate in all the meetings that I've you know, volunteered to the people to, uh, to serve them. But w our families do want us to be able to take a vacation, and that would be very helpful. Mr. Townsend. Uh, it was an off, off comment. Um, to Mr. Fearborn's point with regard to the conference call, I'm sure Mr. Eek and others have participated in, in um, there's other tech, additional technologies, even with the presentations, you can do web-based where you send a, a link to that individual, they log on and you can, uh, while the presenter is controlling it, I'm watching in sync with everyone instead of saying turn to page three or page four. So there's opportunities even with um, web-based apps that are nominal fees, I don't know from a corporate level, that provides those options in addition to the conference call, because sometimes that link does go down and the conference call for the audio is beneficial, so just as an idea. But I am also, I would, I would agree that having that ability to participate in a work session uh, when away is, is excellent. Mr. Holman. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I, I'm in favor of it as, as Councilmember Barber's proposed work session only, not in any uh, format where we might vote, such as an actual council meeting or an executive session. I did have a question. We've talked about the technology. Mr. Eakey, is it possible for us to get the hologram projection so you can see me standing there and turning around, you know, from like the Star Wars thing? I mean, somebody's got it, right? Not while you're in the shower, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not a, I'm not for this at all. This is the third time this has come up since I've been on the city council. Um, one thing, and I haven't heard anybody say this, and I'm not assuming that this would happen, uh, but back in the days when Ms. Abdelgawad and Mr. Ryan Cote and I served on the subcommittee for the roundabout feature, there was uh, one time that we tried to FaceTime Councilman uh, West Coat in and we it was a miserable failure because it just the connection was horrible and this and that and uh, I think Mr. Uh, Crass was at that meeting that night and uh, not to throw you underneath the, the oats bus there Mike but uh, it, it was very challenging at that time you know that goes back some years ago I, I, I'll admit that but that was definitely challenging now 
with what Mr. Uh, Fuhrerborn was talking about, the conference call, I use those all the time at work, you know, with my colleagues in Albuquerque and other places, but, um, and it works fine for us. Um, we've got a very substantially more powerful thing than, than what we're used to here, but um, not that I'm supporting this in any way at, at that, but I do know the capability is there. Where, where, where my opposition for this is, is in our, in our charter um, review and the amendments that went to the, to the voters, we are now, the, the charter is that work sessions are now required attendance where before it wasn't. And I think that this here is just an opportunity for us to, um, for council, whoever it is, to find a, 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 a loophole or a roundabout for attendance, you know. Now, that goes back, and I agree, to the, to the intent of the person, because we are self-policing, you know, but most people that I've, that I've served with over the years on the council would pull their fingernails out to be here, you know, um, even me. I, tonight, today was a horrible day. I went home and I slept and I wake up seven minutes after five. I'm like, oh my gosh. So that's why I'm late tonight. But it goes back to that, that the responsibility that, that I asked for when, when I put myself on the ballot is that I would be here for each and every meeting that I could be here, you know. Um, the city of Raymore is not gonna end with me missing one meeting or two meetings, you know, and it happened when I had my bicycle accident. Um, you know, things happen, you know. It's, the city is not in such dire straits that it is going to require everybody to be here every single moment, every single night that there is a meeting. and. Uh, I, I just, I don't, I'm not in favor of opening up this Pandora's box for the, you know, for the third time now that, you know, for the same reasons, same justifications been very well spoken about before. Thank you. Well, you bring up a good point in that the Charter Commission did review this and I was going to challenge Mr. Burke and or Mr. Zur to your recollection about the, the, the conversation that went on about this with regard to attendance. And do, do we go by Webster's definition of attendance? And that's physical participation. You know, what, it, what is it that, that the charter conversation or the charter intent, the change to require work sessions to be to present for uh, might need to have some input from you on that? Sure. Two aspects of this. Um, and first, I want to cover the first portion of this, which would be the legality with regard to sunshine, which is going to be your first major hurdle to get past. Um, basically, you've got statutory provisions out there. The statute does not prohibit listening to a meeting via phone, but an elected official cannot cast a roll call vote by phone, and a person attending by phone would not count towards the quorum requirements. So you got statutory provisions there at that point. There are provisions where a vote could occur um, and the rule doesn't apply with regard to committee meetings, so that would be applicable, for, for example, to a work session meeting. The rule also doesn't apply in certain circumstances with regard to emergency meetings. You are, and Councilman Kellogg made a great point of saying this, you are self-policing as an entity, as a body. Um, and as far as the information with regard to attendance is concerned, again, you all would be the arbiter for what it qualifies as attendance. My argument would be if you are present uh, and able to see and hear the activities going on in the room, whether that be by Skype or otherwise, you are probably falling within legal terms of attendance. Okay. Mr. Ullman, I saw your hand up. Yeah, um, if it becomes an argument of, gee, do I get attendance credit, Mr. Mayor, I don't care. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing how the hoarding report turned out. I, I'm here for the education. If you want to give me the one demerit for missing the meeting, the fact is, is I'm going to call you beforehand and tell you if I can't be there, and it's usually because of work. But I'm interested in actually hearing the message as to going back piecemeal later on to Mr. Fearborn, Mr. Eke, to Mr. Cataret, to Chief, and finding out a little bit more about what took place here 
That's what I like about it. Like I said, I don't care about the attendance. You want to dock me on attendance, fine. I'd like to have the opportunity to listen in on the conversation and maybe make a few comments. That's my position on it. Because that, the comment part is the only thing missing. Yeah. Because we've got live stream. You can watch this infinitum afterwards if you want to. But uh, OK. Mr. Barber? Yeah, and I, I should have uh, kind of added to this. Um, I'm okay, I mean, me personally, and I'm not speaking for anybody else, but I'm okay for it not counting as a, an attended meeting. What I, my intent was, if when there is a special, special circumstance that somebody still wants to participate, they're six hours away, you know, at, the, at their lake house, but they can, they can get to a phone and they'd like to participate, maybe to ask some questions or make some comments. There's nothing like a live meeting, and there's nothing harder to kind of get the vibe is to watch a recorded meeting, in my mind. To watch a recorded meeting and try to get the whole vibe of it is more difficult than being on the phone and participating, even if all you're doing is listening. And, um, and I might add the technology has changed um, with, the inter with the internet, it's more robust than things are. And I just think this is something that, you know, again, uh, you know, it's our technology is going to evolve, evolve, and evolve. And I said it. You know, I was for it three or four years ago. Let's at least stick our toe in it and start start the process because we know eventually there's going to be some different avenues where we can. We might have a Skype meeting here that we instead of have these people come in and present to us, we do a live live meeting for them. So anyway, that was just my two cents. Sir, Mr. Allman. I'd like to ask Councilmember Kellogg if if we adjusted it to where it's not an attendance, so you, you don't you're not getting credit for the attendance. You're okay. Would you be okay with us going forward? With no, no, okay. no. It's just here's here's my personal example. Last year, around Christmas time, I was in San Antonio. That's my drive in 13 hours there. And the topic on the work session that night was for um, the endowment, the new endowment we were starting up. I was at my mother's house with the live stream watching on TV. And I was sending texts, giving thumbs up to the mayor of things you guys that everybody was talking about. And he was getting those messages back and forth. Um, the attendance is, you know, I don't, I'm not worried about the attendance myself. I've, I've rarely served with anybody on the council that I've had to worry about the attendance that they've had or that they're going to have. I don't think that's a problem. I believe, again, like what I've said, we are self-policing and that we are very responsible individuals by the fact that we ask voters to bestow this, this responsibility upon us, and I believe 98% of the people I've served with have taken that, that seriously to the point to where they've taken that step. They've taken the step that, that I've heard Ms. Abdelgawad speak of very oftenly, you know, when she's, when she's gone, that she's absolutely comfortable with what's happened because she had a chance to review the meeting and that she's went through it. You know, before, Several years back, it was very common for, for us to abstain from a consent agenda item because we missed a meeting. As we progress further in that timeline, and I've seen less and less people have, have used that option because we have reviewed those meetings. We are confident that we are up to date with it. So we, we all of us, you know, I, I speak generally, we now say, yay to the to the consent agenda item i just i still can't support this i i i, I just can't I, I i i i feel that when when i put my name on the ballot i put my name on the ballot to be here and i didn't i wasn't one that was in favor of the required attendance for for work session meetings i thought that was a little over the board, but that's what the voters said, and that's what I'm in for, so I'm here. You know, I, it, it's, it's a personal responsibility. Now, for Skype or something like that, if I was at work tonight and this was allowed, personally, I wouldn't be able to do it because I can't have those kind of conversations where I work. I can't take my cell phone there, okay? 
down at the lake, you know. I'm not a big lake fan, but I do know many of the people that I work with or I associate with that have lake property down there and spend a lot of time down there, their cell service is poor. And I don't even know that, that they would be able to do it, you know, if I was to take a vacation down there. So, you know, that, that justification just doesn't, I don't know, I, I, I guess I'm old fashioned. I'll be 52 next week, you know. Um, I, I, I still appreciate the fact that Mr. Schubach was the postmaster here in, in Raymore, so thank you. <laughs> Mr. Burgess, did you have a follow-up? No. Mr. Barber. Yeah, yeah and, and I respect your, um, you know, in 52 is not old, even though Mr. Hu Mrs. Hubach used to say that was a senior citizen, it's not, but think about, the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to convince you, but think about this, we didn't always record our meetings. We didn't always do that. So technology changed where we could do it. Our meetings used to be the uh, the audio was it was okay and the video was horrible. We upgraded our system so we could do that. So we have a better meeting to look at and view. So you have embraced technology. You have you just told me you did watch some meetings. What I'm saying is there's other steps we may or may not want to take. You don't, you don't just stop and say, okay, that's as good as it's going to get. What else can we do? So that's the only reason for bringing up. This may not get used at all. It may be horrible. It may not work. Um, but, you know, we, we have, this city has been progressive and we have moved forward. And it's not to have somebody skip meetings. It's actually do the opposite. It's for somebody to be able to participate. So. Mr. Circo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Barber. I'm looking at not everybody's the same. We all have different ideas, different opinions. What I see here is if somebody's out of town, they want to still participate in just this work session. They want to maybe get their voice out on an item on the agenda at night, just so other people can hear it, for the city council people here can hear that. So we have our opinion. We want to hear someone else who's not here. I can see what he's talking about. It's pretty simple. It's not asking for the world, you're not voting, you're not doing anything, but they want to be involved because they're out of town. They want to be involved because they can't be here, but they want to be involved still if they can and take the time wherever they're at to be involved and just give their opinion on an item we're talking about. That's all it is, communication, because we're all different, we all have different opinions, but it's good to hear all the different opinions. So I don't see nothing wrong with that because they're not voting on anything. It's nothing, you know, you know they can see it, but they can actually communicate with us. Just give their opinion as a council person that's why they were elected by the people to give the voice of the people and, and speak out, and that's good. We can't always agree on everything, but it's good to hear from everybody's opinion as council people. Mr. Fearmore, did you have an input here? Sorry, Mr. Townsend, but he, had, he stuck up his hand first, unless you want to. He's got pressure. He okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, council member. You, um, you already waved me off a few seconds I did. before. No, that's fine. That's, that's... Because this is a procedural issue on the part of the council, um, May I suggest that that for formalized debate, that this item be brought forward in resolution format to amend the council rules and procedures so that you can have a thumbs up, thumbs down and continue the debate. Townsend, did you did you want to? Oh, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think from a, a work session perspective, on the other end of the spectrum, we've had. Um, was it retail strategies actually give a presentation to us via Skype so we're able to receive uh, a presentation with regard to their plans for retail commercial spaces uh, from Arizona out of state I won't try to try to quote the location but we received a presentation via Skype so I would assume that you know by extension if we have the ability not on a routine basis but you know policing ourselves and as adults Good point. Did you have something else to talk Yeah, one quick point. If we have the technology, like you speak, spoke of the octopus, we have technology, it's already here. We're not going to spend that. We don't have to add to a budget. We can actually utilize what we have sitting out here in a closet doing nothing. If it's there, why not use it and give an opportunity to the people? I don't see nothing wrong with that. That's true. <laughs> That's right. There'll be more debate. Okay. Anything else? There's nothing else. We will now go into oh, one, yeah, one very fast other item for okay. you all. Um, as you all know, uh, the legislature 
uh, put to a vote of the people and the people have passed a medical marijuana uh, issue. We, several of us, were down at Mark for a presentation on that along with a number of other cities this past week. Very, very good presentation, good discussion. Quite a few cities are going to be bringing forward to their legislative bodies uh, a, I suppose it would be a resolution too, to in essence put any action, any change to the code uh, on administrative hold because the state has not yet issued the guidelines associated with the legislation. And I would recommend that the council give me the nod to bring forward a resolution for this city in regard to that. It will give, if any council members, and I know the mayor has already been contacted, or contacted by anybody wanting to start the business or set up a pharmacy, we can point to the resolution and the fact that we do not have state guidance and be pretty concrete in making that decision. Excellent. Thanks, sir. Thank you. And as stated by Mr. Fearborn on item two, we do have a reason to move into executive session for the relocated Kentucky Road project. So I would entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move that we go into executive session to discuss litigation matters and real estate acquisition matters as authorized by Missouri State Statute 610.021, subsections one and two. I'll second the motion, sir. Thank you, motion been made and seconded to move into executive session. Roll call. Have a roll call. Yes, it is. Councilman Barber? Yes. Councilman Holman? Yes. Councilman Berenson? Yes. Councilman Burke? Yes. Councilman Serco? Yes. Councilman Kellogg? Yes. Councilman Townsend? Yes. Okay. We're going to the executive session. When we adjourn from that, we'll be adjourned. <laughs>